Kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Ryan Avery. I'm an engineer here at uh, Stantec and I'll be your host for the afternoon. Um, I think I'll start off with a bit of a, a background on the New Zealand Coastal Society. Um, we are a organization that's formed way back in 1992 um, to provi promote and ad uh, advance knowledge uh, um, and understanding of the coastal zone. Um, it provides us a forum for those with interest in the coastal zone to communicate amongst each other as well as to the public, um, as well as give, um, you know, a place for all of us to come together because of the multidisciplinary nature of coastal management, especially in New Zealand. This means that many of our members are from other in uh, areas of engineering, such as um, the planning field or um, uh, mechanical or, you know, coastal civil engineer like myself. Um, so yeah, there's many space for this. So in that uh, regards, there's no um, entry criteria for the society um, and we welcome membership from anyone. Um, I think the membership fee is about $85 a year, um, but students are free, which is quite cool. And there is also corporate membership available. So if you are interested, um, check out uh, the, the email there. Um, as far as tonight, uh, we're going to start off with uh, myself. I'm going to talk about um, a choice Swiss army knife, which is coastal engineering. Um, then we'll go over to Steve Raynor with Willy Wonka's golden golden ticket. Um, Emily Tidy is going to explore the um, exploring with the hydrographer. Um, and Craig Davies is going to take us for a trip to the beach. Um, as Holly mentioned, if you have any questions, please um, do give um, us a shout by putting the, the questions in the comment. Um, and then afterwards, we'll go through and um, have a bit of a Q&A session where we will open up to the panel and um, can then address some of your comments. Um, yeah, so moving on to... Uh, my talk, I have called it a choice with army knife. Reason being is that I'm going to run you a little bit through my career and just kind of point out how versatile uh, the coastal environment is. Um, I must admit, I didn't start in coastal engineering. I, funny enough, my first job was actually on a mine in Zambia. Um, I was born and grew up in South Africa, so one of the com companies there worked um, out in Zambia and I was doing civil works. Uh, that there on the left is me up a 100 meter high shaft um, head unit, which um, yeah, it was quite cool. I learned a lot, learned a lot about construction and gave me a bit of experience there. Um, and there in the middle is one of my favorite structures that I built, which is actually a penstock for a tailings dam. Um, but just kind of sparked off my interest in water, water engineering. Um, then I moved back to South Africa and got a job with a port and coastal engineering company called PRDW. Um, and there I started off getting a little bit uh, of experience in construction as well as this project, which was essentially blocking off a saltwater um, canal so that they can do some construction next to it. Um, in that allowed for a whole bunch of different opportunities to work around, um, you know, design and implementation and those kind of things. But because it was in the saltwater environment, we kind of got involved in it. And um, yeah, it was a, a very cool project to work, work through. Um, then I was working on an LPG pipeline offshore um, there. Uh, it was getting pulled off by that barge that's sitting over there and I was lucky enough to go out and uh, spend some time in the barge. And essentially here that um, big hydraulic ram on the right um, would actually pull this concrete pipe um, out to sea um, bit by bit um, and it was taking days but there was even enough time that they could stop and weld two steel sections together and coat it in concrete before it made its way out there so that was a really interesting project um, and yeah because you've got to 
we're working with the ocean here, we had to think of a lot of different aspects such as making sure that that pipeline was stable and that's why it's um, encased in concrete so that it can stay solid in the ground even when you get some serious waves coming in here. Um, then uh, I worked on another pipeline up. Um, which went out to sea and actually managed to go out there. This is in Madagascar. Um, here, a tailings mine um, needed some uh, stormwater discharged off at sea, and um, I was involved in upgrading that or the prelim design for the upgrade of that. So we went out there, and you can see it's quite a big facility that uh, um, pump motor on the left there goes down to a vertical turbine pump underneath on a barge, which you could see just there in the corner, um, but that headed all the way out to a groin, um, which was taking a bit of a beating in the Madagascan um, uh, east coast, which gets some seriously big um, uh, cyclones. So yeah, we had to look at that pipeline stability over there and the diffuser, diffuser which was offshore. Uh, luckily enough on that trip, I managed to spend a, a weekend visiting Madagascar and Metalima, which is quite cool. Engineering is really a, a, an awesome field where you can get out there and it does take you to some really interesting places. Um, yeah, this is another project for St. Helena. Unfortunately, I didn't get out there, but um, I was part of the team that that uh, did uh, the structure. Um, there you can see some of the concrete army units going on. Um, and I helped out a lot with the services for that, uh, that facility. Um, so yeah, that was a really interesting project that, that uh, PRDW worked on for, for many years. Um, and here, one of my favorite projects, uh, I don't know if you heard of, um, day zero in South Africa, but essentially we were running out of water and uh, PRDW was tasked with coming up with the design for a um, intake and discharge system for seawater for a desalination plant. Um, this was a really fast paced project um, and um, yeah, it was really cool. At your own leisure, you can click on that link and you can see how that pipeline was installed. But it's it's really interesting when you've got to take into account things like marine sediment and how we're going to keep the pipe on the ground while at the same thing, we, at the same time we've got to install it. So that pipe needs to be um, floatable to get out there and work with divers and all those kind of things. Um, as well as I had a lot of work with this intake structure over here, making sure that it stayed stable, um, even when you get some really big waves coming over the top, but at the same time, not entrapping fish or seals or sharks or anything that's going around there. So there's some guidelines around there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many aspects to it. Um, and then as well, like we had to put this pump station on the beach. So how do we protect it with rock armor in front um, and make sure that it's stable? And we designed this whole pump station so that it fitted in a container so we could fabricate it, you know, in a workshop and then just dump it on here just to bring it up nice and quick. So there's some really big aspects there. And then also that that rock needs to get sized for those waves coming in. So um, there's there's lots to it. Um, and then a little bit more closer to shore, I've been working, or here in New Zealand, I've been working on an outfall in, in Hastings. And here we, you know, we need to make sure that this beach is um, not going to wash away and uncover our pipe. And then also that the groin that was installed a couple of years ago is sufficient. So we've been kind of updating there, um, which is quite cool. So there's many aspects of it and it's taken me to Hawke's Bay, which is obviously quite, quite uh, beautiful. Um, yeah, I will also like to plug the New Zealand Coastal Society. I was part of the South African equivalent um, back there and, and set it up and I've been involved since I've moved over to New Zealand. Um, and on the right, you can see I got a chance to play around with um, docking a ship um, with one of the, the workshops we did, plus talks like this and opportunities to get in front of people is always great. There on the left, uh, we were talking about the Wellington Cross Harbour Pipeline, which is the reason why I was employed by Stantic in the first place. Um, so yeah, there's, there's uh, lots of opportunities if you get involved in societies like this.
Um, and as well, I did a master's in coastal engineering and got to present here at the water conference, um, which is quite cool. You get uh, many opportunities and interesting things there. I actually used drones to measure currents in the surf zones. So um, had a, another part of the multi-tool, which is my coastal engineering experience. Um, and it's really cool to get to get out there and there are lots of aspects to it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's many opportunities. Um, yeah, so I'm going to end off there. There's a nice view of that I took with my drone during it. Um, and I'd like to, uh, yeah, now pass on to Steve. So if you have any other questions, just chuck them into the, the, the panel below and we'll discuss them at the end. Um, Steve, do you want to take over? You just had to activate your microphone up the top if you haven't, Steve. And your camera as well. Okay, oh there we go. Lovely. And your microphone again, sorry. So just up the top, sorry Steve, you just need to activate your microphone. You can click the icon until it's green. Okay, what we might do is we'll head over to Emily and Steve, I'll troubleshoot with you in the background, eh? And we'll get that going. So Emily, if you're there, we'll um, get you up and set. Thank you. Okay. Alrighty, am I here? Yes. Righto, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Emily Toku Ingoa no te komiti oku tipuna. Ko te noho o ki roto pāteki o te poti. I learned that in Māori Language Week this week. I'm uh, Hi everyone, I'm uh, Emily. I grew up in Bucklands Beach in Auckland and I'm um, now based in uh, Roto Pāteki in Macandrew Bay down in Dunedin. So um, there's a couple of pictures of me uh, from a young child playing with charts on my parents' boat to um, a few years ago. So as you can see, a few more years have gone by, another child and a few lockdowns, um, but that that's where I am. So as I mentioned, I grew up at Buckland's Beach, did lots of sailing with my family and um, and I've always been interested in the sea and the charts and that's the, that's the view at the end of the street now from where I live. So I really benefit from being involved with the um, New Zealand Coastal Society as a hydrographic surveyor. It's nice to um, see all the different things that happen in this um, in this environment. So thanks for uh, coming along and giving me the chance to talk about something that I really like, which is hydrographic surveying. So I'll whip through this presentation. So what are, um, this is this is really just about me and my thoughts. So. Um, I did a gap year out of school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, considered uh, engineering and uh, ended up looking at surveying which is down in Otago University so it had that nice indoor-outdoor mixture and crucially it had um, really good job prospects at the end of it all. So I did a four-year degree, it's the only place you can um, study surveying um, for a B-Surf in New Zealand at Otago, um, competitive first year uh, entry and specialised in hydrographic surveying, that's the, the water part in my third and fourth year. And then I was employed by a company called uh, Fugro, who had an office in, uh, in New Plymouth, but is an international uh, company. And I started straight away training on all the um, sorts of things like firefighting and sea survival. And there's um, a still from um, the training that we have to do for ditching out of a helicopter if you, um, if you crash in, into the water. So that's quite fun. One of the first jobs I got to do was um, heading to Alaska, probably one of my best jobs ever, to be honest, um, working on this big mothership to the to the right there and going out on wee boats called R2 and D2 in the daytime, um, mowing up and down and um, mapping the seabed using acoustics to um, get the depth. We also had to go ashore and um, calibrate tide gauges and of course we surveyors were all interested in measurements and levels and vertical datums and all that stuff, so if you want to chat to me about that, um, let me know. Um, uh, when we were ashore there, of course, we were looking out for bears, so that was quite exciting for me coming from New Zealand. Also carried on in, in um, America and ended up doing, oh, there's me with the guys looking for bears. Um, and of course, we do a bit of fishing on the side, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's our, um, there's some of our bathymetry, um, so the, uh, the red stuff's the shallow and then, um, and then deeper out to the blue. 
So then another job I did pretty similar um, after that was working up the coast of California from um, San Diego at the bottom right up to Crescent City, mapping all the way in this uh, crusty little cray uh, boat, crab boat, um, going into really posh marinas across um, the, the coast of California, which were very different cultures. Um, very interesting place um, to be working, and that was more day work, which is quite um, interesting. But then nautical charting was to um, update the, the area for safety, for navigation, but also to help people modelling uh, sea level rise tsunami risks and um, we did some measurements for kelp reseeding areas where they were doing some research on that as well. Also been um, doing some work in New Zealand, a bit of mapping behind them, some surf breaks in, uh, in Taranaki using this jet boat um, called the Rowania and then also out on um, out to the installations offshore in New Zealand there laying um, cables and pipelines so my position on the boat was about um, positioning <laughs> uh, where stuff went um, on the surface and also where it ended up on the seabed comparing the as-builts to the, um, uh, the design and um, working with all the different people like divers and the ROV remotely operated vehicle operators. Um, pretty interesting working on the larger construction vessels out there on the platforms, um, usually really good food, um, sometimes good recreational facilities, um, uh, sometimes this kind of thing. I think you can see the sign there on the um, on the boat that I that one of the boats that I was working on out there. Headed off to Australia, so I think in similarity to, to Ryan, lots of travel opportunities, certainly in the past anyway. Um, in Australia, worked on quite a few different um, different vessels and um, all, all different projects. One of the projects, um, if I go backwards, sorry, on the blue boat, was um, habitat mapping along the coast of Victoria with Deakin University, which was really fun. Um, further over on the west coast, a bit more of this positioning business, um, positioning the boats, positioning divers underwater, doing uh, underwater welding and fixing on um, pipelines and positioning all the stuff we're dropping down to them on the cranes where the anchors were, um, keeping the boat in one place so you don't drag the divers off behind you um, and, and what, washing out for that sort of safety stuff. Another project was a diff different one again, which was in a small boat and just um, mowing up and down the lawn again, mapping the bathymetry of an area, um, but then working into the really shallow stuff till we really um, till we touched touch bottom really, um, crawling around there, and that was um, that was for habitat mapping again, um, and for tsunami modelling. Um, and a lot of a lot of tidal work had to be undertaken in these estuaries. This is the raw data um, that we would see on the boat before we apply all of that to it. This was a different job. We went ashore each day, so that was quite cool. Then we got to head over to um, to Europe and do a whole lot more charting. Uh, we found um, 30 uncharted wrecks in the Baltic Sea, which is still a bit of a highlight there as well. Um, at 2 a.m. in the morning, it's easy to imagine some of them have got chests of gold and stuff, but um, I think that's just the tiredness. Um, also did some site survey work for a lot of the wind farm constructions off um, Germany and Denmark, where the sea's nice and shallow. Um, but there's, of course, uh, unexploded ordnance and all sorts of stuff down there that you have to be careful of, um, that you have to map out and check what's there. And then again, um, check the, the as built as compared to design. Um, did some work in Turkey on a on a, um, a seismic work before the, a bridge was built, and then actually got to travel across the bridge a few years later as a tourist, which was pretty cool. Um, there's just some photos from my cabin on the Baltic Sea. Nice calm day, and um, and obviously not a not a calm day. Um, what's life like on the bigger boats when we head out sometimes you get to work up on the bridge with the the crew and you know what's going on other times you're dumped out in a in a, in a container out on the back deck for us as surveyors usually some kind of um pretty decent cabins you might be sharing with someone but you'd be on the opposite shift to them and um usually on the boats where you're not going ashore it's 12 hour days seven days a week just keep going and going um so you've got to um be able to get on with all sorts of different people that you're out there uh, out there living with and um things like birthdays and stuff just keep keep happening obviously when you're out there. So after I'd done a little bit of that work I thought I'd go back to uh, back to uni and did my masters at um, the University of Plymouth, the, the old Plymouth, um, over in the UK and did some work with um, making underway measurements with this um, picture that you've got there of, um, of an underwater uh, underway SVP. Um, and I did this course because it was going to lead to, um, uh, it's an internationally recognised course, sorry, so that it, it let me um, uh, build on some more experience there. And now I've headed back to uh, Otago, where it all began, and I'm, um, and I'm lecturing and have started looking at a, uh, at a PhD there. So that's some of our boats that we've got down here at Otago and some of the students that I've been, um, been teaching. So um, 
some of my research pictures lately, just having a look at the different returns on the seafloor and the different acoustics. If we change the frequency, can we pick up um, finer scale uh, changes and habitat changes and how can that help us understand the, um, the coastal environment a little bit more? Um, and down here at Otago, myself and my students, we've done work with the um, Yellow-Eyed Penguin Trust, the DOC, Notahu, um, lots of different people that are interested in knowing like what's down there. Sometimes we're probably the first people mapping it, which I um, which I quite like. That's why I use the word exploring for us. Um, and then usually sort of how can it be protected or how can we best um, um, manage what's going on um, uh, down below. A couple of thoughts as I, as I finish up here and as I was asked to... Um, as I was, I was thinking about doing this, um, things that I think have um, gone well and ideas as, as memberships that I belong to, so the Coastal Society and then for surveying, obviously, Surveying Spatial and the International um, Federation of Surveyors, Australasian Hydrographic Society are really helpful to me. And through them, the different connections and the people that I've met um, have really helped me. Uh, something for me as, as, a, as a hydrographic surveyor, I wish I'd uh, worked on my certification earlier. It's not a requirement as yet for anything beyond charting and so that um, it's taken me longer than it and it probably should have. Um, uh, being female offshore has been interesting at times. I think um, sometimes I've felt like I'm a bit of a pain as people have tried to work to get accommodation or bathroom facilities and bits and pieces but um, and um, other times people would talk to the male surveyor next to me even if I'm training them before talking to me but usually um, a little bit of communication and, and everything seemed to go quite smoothly and the final thing I've got there is, um, is since 2016 I've had had two little kids and um, it's definitely busy couldn't have done that uh, still working offshore and going on boats and heading up and down the coast and so um, I'm very lucky to have had a very supportive husband and uh, and co-workers who let me take time off and then come back sort of part-time so if you um, if you end up in that space um, it's it's definitely harder than I ex expected it to be um, but hang in there and if you're in the supporting space keep up the good work is all I can say. Last slide there, the stuff I'm thinking about that's exciting for all of us is just that we need to think about the coastal zone and how all our data's been collected and how we can share and work together more, how we can join the land and the sea, you know, it's not two separate areas, it actually just continues as most of us um, in the coastal society would know. And I think um, for engineering and surveying, it's quite exciting to think about these black box technologies and autonomous um, uh, setups that maybe are taking um, some of the operations away for us in some ways, but also it's um, really important that we keep control of the planning and the quality control and that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and one of the biggest opportunities when we can all again is obviously the, uh, the travel out there. So I'll finish up by saying you Thank you very much. I'm happy to talk to anyone at any time if you want to send me a message after this or I'll uh, look forward to the questions um, later. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We'll now hand over to Steve. Right on. There we go. So everyone's listening. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you. So you heard I'm going to talk about a golden ticket, one of these, a Woolly Wonka's golden ticket. And uh, it is really, uh, for us, a golden ticket can get you in anywhere. Uh, that this golden ticket that I'm talking about really is an engineering, an engineering degree. It seems to have... Um, made such a difference to to getting a job, to doing some amazing things around the world. And so I want to talk to you about three ways to take your golden ticket and make it even even better, to supercharge it even further. The first place I'd like to tell you about is a, an interesting place, Port of Salala. I'm not going to tell you about a whole lot of details, but it was my introduction to um, how serious creatures of the sea can be. So I was working in a port. It's a desert around the area and there were sea worms that were eating through our concrete key walls uh, faster at one stage than we could replace them. So the key walls are about 18 tons of concrete each section and these these worms were burrowing into it so fast that I mean, our replacement sections weren't coming that fast. It's just amazing that the worms could eat concrete faster than we could reinstall it. Interestingly this port in Salada um, had sandbags as the foundation and you begin to th think of strange things, but this was started, the port was started in the late 60s when there was a civil war on that place. So the port key walls were started under, under um, gunfire. 
So that's why they use sandbags and eventually built key walls above that. So what I'm here really to tell you about is how do I got to these amazing places and saw, see so many cool things uh, around the world. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more um, ab about that. So I started my career pretty much as a standard engineering career. Um, I, but since then I've met amazing people. And the three things that I think now when I look back that have made such a difference, um, the first one would be that I've always had an attitude of lifelong learning. We never, never stop learning. Um, there is always something interesting out there to to look at, to learn, to understand. And as Kiwis, uh, um, we it's great to have a sense of wonder and awe of the things that are around us. It's good to keep your brain learning. Um, whether you're outside looking at nature and the environment or whether you're in a classroom. Um, and with each of these points that I've got, I said there's three, there's probably more. Um, there's a little side piece saying, um, I wonder if there's a warning there. And so my thoughts on lifelong learning is, is a bachelor's enough? Should we be continuing to spend time in the classroom as well as learning? Um, we are professionals and perhaps we need to do that. The second part of the lessons that, that, that developed for me was on Bougainville Island, which is uh, part of Papua New Guinea at the time. Um, and it's in a copper mine high up in the mountains, and that's a beautiful picture of one of the volcanoes on that island. Uh, the place was really active. We had at least a, a uh, one earthquake a week, and I'd have to drive to the coast each, each time there was an earthquake to make sure that the stop banks hadn't failed. Um, it was a great place to be, but I did see the devastation that careless um, engineering, careless commercial gain can make because in the mountains there was a, a copper mine and all the overburden was spilled down the river onto the sea. So what a mess they made. But the second lesson that I learned on that there is um, don't specialize too soon in your career. Don't get too early into a particular field. I think we probably do a little bit fast these days. But as soon as you leave the shores of New Zealand, you find that the generalists are much more valued. You can help a place like Bougainville Island with your generalist skills. So you can do a water supply, or you can do stop banks, um, or you can do something structural. The generalists, I think, have a little bit more fun as you, as you go around the world. And a second warning, actually, from my time in Bougainville Island, uh, while I was there, I was doing something like 70 hours a week, every week. I was away from family, and there was an advice at the time from a very senior engineer. It said, if you want to be an engineer, just think carefully about your family and what are you going to do, because engineering can be quite challenging on families. So a couple of warnings there, but so far, keep learning throughout your life and don't specialize too early. Generalists have more fun. Uh, the third thing was to stay professionally ascended in some form. In fact, I would suggest in a couple of forms, one national, one international. If I go back to have a look at the 1960s, which is when I think engineer, the last cycle the engineers were revered in, in our society, in our culture, um, was when the moonshots were happening. We were sort of in the middle of the Cold War and we were looking at getting to the moon. 1969, we got on the moon. It was pretty amazing. And so engineers were well respected. But the interesting thing in that was the same technology that was used for getting to the moon was used for inter, uh, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And that theme comes with us as engineers. There is no profession in, user, in, in the world, actually, that is so thoroughly developed specifically to destroy our planet. We are so well trained to destroy the planet. But at the same time, there is no one um, so specifically trained also, or so uniquely talented to save our planet. And in these times when global warming is causing a major problem, I think we're about to enter another cycle of engineers being well respected in the community as those who can save us. Um, we're going to be looked to, uh, that there is no other profession that can actually assist like that. So in those times, pressure's on, integrity is key. Uh, we need to stay professionally associated. Um, and so when it comes to saving the planet, I'm suggesting that a bachelor's is not enough. And like me, I suggest you go on to a master's and a, and a, a, a PhD. And it's great to hear that Emily did that as well. So I talked about a pulse test earlier in, in, in my 
bio. So if you, some as an engineer, if you go somewhere, you often your only test or employment is you're an engineer. Do you have a pulse? You're alive. Great. I'll give you a job. So another result of the pulse test was that I went to the Middle East and I lectured in a university for um, engineers. And those buildings you see in the background there, um, you can see the Burj Khalifa in there, which is the tallest building in the world, 840 meters. It was in, I was watching that being constructed. Uh, that was my, pretty much my only claim to fame, apart from at the university, we did concrete testing and every year we had a concrete mix competition and one of the young students, um, their family owned the concrete supply company that supplied concrete to the Burj Khalifa. Our concrete testing machines went to 133 MPA, which most of you will know what that is, and that is really strong concrete. Uh, we couldn't break the concrete from the Burj Khalifa. It was better strength than 133 MPA. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, so what I learned from in that the world is as an engineer look to con contribute to the societies around you contribute back into the communities um, that'll take you very quickly internationally if you're looking to contribute um, i think it was in this place that i still think i have my proudest moments as i was educating young engineers who are first literate generation of their family very special i thought i th think that was a contribution that uh, i made and, and i quite enjoyed it and I encourage you to look for ways to contribute your engineering into the community. There's a little bit of a warning there too. You may like it so much that you just never come back. And one last thing is, uh, so I said there's three, now you see there's five. So this is a bonus. Um, and as engineers and scientists, you can choose the three that work for you. But look for opportunities is the other one. Um, so often we grow up in New Zealand, certainly we have a, a, a right and wrong perspective on life. Um, whereas so many other places around the world have a very different perspective. And for us to understand that, we do need to travel. We live in a world of proving innocence. Um, and therefore that makes us a little reluctant to take opportunities. Uh, so proof of innocence is, is more important to us very often. I would encourage you to get past that and back yourself to try a few new things to get out there and explore, take opportunities. And so there's, there's the list, the list of three, which has grown a little bit. Continue to learn all of your life. Don't specialize too soon. Uh, stay professionally associated. And I would suggest a New Zealand one is great because you're here. Stick, find an international one to be a member of and contribute to all of them. Um, and look for opportunities that are bigger than just you. And so this is the final bit. This is actually the Willy Wonka's golden ticket. And it says at the very bottom, in your wildest dreams, you could not imagine the marvelous surprises that await you. And I would suggest as engineers with our golden ticket, um, that's us as well. And I'd like to see you there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. We will now hand over to Craig for our final presentation. Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai, nō paratānia o ku tūpuna, nō kurikiria roa o ku mātua, i noho ana hau i whangparaua. Ko Craig Davis tāko, ngā ngā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hi all, uh, Craig Davis is my name and I'm uh, an engineer. Uh, I've got a small practice, coastal engineering and um, planning up in Whangarawa in the North Auckland. Um, as you'll see from my first slide, I can't spell lightning, um, but it's because I'm an engineer. So um, as the last presenter, I've got the opportunity of putting you all to sleep or getting you to turn off this, this webinar and go to social media and I'll, I'll do my utmost to do that. Um, but I, as uh, an older engineer talking to some younger guys, I'm going to pontificate about uh, how my career has gone, give you a perspective from, from that end of the career um, and give you an overview of an engineer's overview of an engineer's career, um, which I've called a trip to the beach because in my career I've, I've gone to do the thing that I really like doing, which is being at the beach, and that's how I end up at Coastal Society. That might not be the, the sexiest beach in the world. In fact, as an engineer, I've got a photo of the, of the bit of debris on it that needs removing. 
but that beach looked like that before we started. And that's the thing that floats my boat is, is uh, making beaches that uh, people can use. So, um, but I didn't start there. My message from the talk today is, as young people starting out, especially do what interests you. Just do the pursue the stuff that makes sense to you that you like. Work hard on what you do, and you'll be allowed to do the stuff you like. Um, and make a job about what's important in your life. And so you make sure that your the whole work for life and live to work thing. Use your job as a means of doing stuff. I heard you know, some of those talks about Emily going and doing these amazing beaches and um, and uh, Steve and, and and Ryan all going doing crazy things with their work. So the opportunity is there. Think about that when you're picking jobs. I think it's good. Um, and um, you've got more time than you think you have. I remember as a student thinking, I've just spent bloody years at university. And I did spend an extra one because I was a bit busy misbehaving. And, um, but you've got more time. You can retrain and do stuff. And if you find another part of engineering takes your fancy, you've got time to do that. My, my career looked a bit like this. I started off in, with a bit of a preference to science and maths. Ended up doing a civil degree at Canterbury Structures. We worked for a little con con uh, consultancy up north, um, shot over to the UK for a while, ended up timber processing Wellington, ended up back up here in Auckland on America's Cup um, construction uh, with Rodney, and then for the last 20 years I've had my coastal practice. Um, so that's the fast version now, I'll, I'll do the slow version. University of Canterbury went down there, I really enjoyed the structures, I liked I got excited about concrete. We had some really cool lecturers down there. So that initially, I started life as a structural engineer, really. Um, I started with a small consultancy, and I found that was really good. They gave you lots of responsibility. You got a wide range of work, and um, it provided a really excellent grounding for the rest of my career. I got some pretty good work, which was good. And my girlfriend was there, which is why I moved up there originally. Um, and the beaches were stunning. Um, I went to London. Did my big OE over there. Um, things were really good when we went over there. So I worked as a contract structure engineer, which gave me the opportunity to work for very large firms, small firms, contracts and consultants, um, which gave me a good um, opportunity to learn what different companies were like, what different cultures were like, and work out things that I like and how I like to work. And so later I could just then go and pursue the sort of job that I wanted. Um, London was pretty cool. There's really old stuff there. As, as a key, it's really old. And you work in cool places that you've heard of on TV and, and on Monopoly boards and things. So we did some work um, on the Daily Telegraph building with the old slides built through it, um, which which was a, a really old building. Part of it was an old pub from the 1600s, which we had, we had to keep. And we kept the facade and built a 12-story building behind it. They say, this is in coastal engineering, this is where we start. I started doing this other stuff and with lots of opportunities. Um, I did some uh, work for a company doing bridging and built bridges uh, in Europe and, and, and in England, and that was a pretty cool job for a while. Um, we built a br bridge overnight on, on one of the very big motorways over there, the M25, and it was all very cool stuff. Um, but I got absolutely ch absolute change of tack when we came back here, my wife got a job down in, in Wellington and um, I started having kids, well, my wife, most hard work, heavy lifting. Um, and I decided to get into um, timber processing. Um, thought it was a great thing, did that for quite a while. Um, we designed and, and built our own kilns, our own medium temperature timber kilns. That fine young man on the right is, is me in a, a younger version. And the man on the left was a very prominent uh, local businessmen who thought we were doing very good things down there. So we did some, it was an opportunity to do something completely different for a while. Um, we ended up selling those kilns up to Winston Pulp International. And um, I moved up to Auckland to start, I was project engineer on the America's Cup base for Fletcher Construction. That's a photo of downtown Auckland, you all know. Um, the base that we were building back in that time was this part of Auckland that was just wasn't there at that time. Um, these these were all wharves that were built at that time. These are the Karen America Cup bases. That's the island with the bridge over which we built the island and those wharves. Um, that's a photo of it uh, being constructed at the time. You see there's no island or, or bridge at that stage. We're just building this is where the America's Cup crews were for the first campaign. 
And I mentioned the first jackout barge, which was, was exciting for me at the time because it was the first one in the country with the barge that could put spuds down and be settled in place. And we just thought it was the, the, the bee's knees at that stage. Um, now I think it's three or four of them in New Zealand. But, um, I went and worked for Rodney Council for a time. I haven't got any slides of that because um, for some reason I haven't got any slides. Um, but it, it was a good job. Um, and really got me into the coastal side of things in terms of coastal management. So they had, they had about a half of Auckland's coast, about a thousand k's of coast, and I was sort of involved in managing that. And um, from that, managed to segue myself into what I wanted to do, which was start my own company and do coastal engineering. Um, and um, work we do, uh, and I've just done some captures off the website, is um, this is beach building, so that was this is again the beach where there was no um, there was no sand before, and now the cool thing you can see footprints in that, which means people have been playing on the sand. Um, that's uh, Shelley Beach. It's another beach that just looks so pretty. Um, this is um, one of the things I will talk a little bit more about um, shortly. Is uh, stabilised sediment. This isn't real uh, bank. Somewhere in that is false, and some of it's made up and we think that's all pretty cool that we can make bank that looks like like natural bank so the environment armored environment looks like the natural environment we build the boardwalk through uh, orake um, and so it's a buzz doing works that a lot of people end up using um, this little private boat ramp and, and uh, um, this is the gulf harbour marina breakwater and pontoons and stuff that we did um, so it's, the work we get to do with the coastal environment is really varied and that's very cool. There's a big overlap between the planning and the environmental and the hard engineering and I think that's the that's the cool part that I like and the, and the, the different thing about coastal engineering is you've got to really think about things other than the, the, the Newton's rules part of it. Um, one of the things we're very big on is making um, false ground out of, as I was talking about, this is just local material mixed with cement to form um, pretend rock, uh, stabilised sediment we like to call it. And um, one of the cool things about this, we had locals that lived there all their lives come and say we didn't realise the local rock, rock outcropped here. And that was a buzz and we all thought that was pretty cool. Um, so my message again, do what interests you. What interests me is going to the beach, so I've made a career of being at the beach. Work hard on what you do and that just allows, gives you a lot of freedom to, to get in and do what you want to do. People are going to let you do what you want to do if you work hard at it. Make sure your job fits in what you do with what your life wants to do and set your life that's important and you've got plenty of time. And uh, that's my lot. I'll go back to a pretty picture. And I'm done. Daughter. Go back to Ryan and some questions. Cool. Thank you, guys. I think there was some very good stuff. I hope there are couple comments more comments coming through i think we'll all turn on our cameras now um yeah so as i said if you uh get a chance go through and um add your comments to the chat um and then we can go from there i had one for um emily did you ever have to strap in uh to sleep at night in the rough sea or anything assuming like it that? was for me and not not just for everyone because they're so excited um, <laughs> um uh, occasionally but there wouldn't be much sleeping going on a, a few times you put your work helmet under the mattress so it makes a slope so that you are pressed against the wall instead of potentially falling out the other side and a couple of times just hanging on there and someone would come through and say don't get up for this shift we just carry we're just hanging on so a few times but um most of the time, all good because you trust the crew and you're working with professionals, and they are all good, in my experience. Yeah. Um, Steve, there's a question from Catherine. Uh, for a young professional, is there a stage in your career which it's um, which is best point to go overseas? Is it worth staying in New Zealand for several years to get chartered before travelling? Yeah, great question, Catherine. Thanks for that. Um, uh, my first point is we stay young. We never really get old. That's okay. And I love Craig's point is that you do have more time than you think. Um, you can go over twice, three times, um, you know, or not at all is okay as well. But I'm recommending that 
the perspective you get from in being embedded in a different culture that views even the values of life differently it will enhance your engineering experience. Um, maybe a couple of years um, before you go overseas, but it's difficult not to get embedded in the ways of of your life and of the ways of doing engineering. So relatively soon is a, is a good time to do it. And, and I suggest um, there are more cultures than just the, the Western ones that we experience. Middle East is a fantastic change um, with some pretty awesome projects over there. So give those sorts of things a try as well. But I think get over reasonably soon so that you can see a different scale and a different approach. And then that will enhance your engineering when you get back to New Zealand. Yeah, especially before you get a partner that draws you back home. Uh, that's, that's yeah, my experience yeah. in Zambia. <laughs> Um, Jack has a question for all of us. Um, it looks like engineering is a great career for traveling. Are there any, are most qualifi qualifications easily transferable? Don't know if anyone got it. Well, I can say from, a, from the point of view that I qualified and am currently registered in South Africa and yet I can still work and um, my qualification as well as my chartership or professional registration still applies here. So I can say that it does. Um, and engineering is engineering, concrete is concrete and, and all those kind of applications still work. I don't know if anyone else yeah, has any. I think um, it's a couple of, depends where you do engineering as to how transferable, but I think the skills are transferable. Of course, there's some, some of the guys that we've made their, their degrees aren't recognized initially. So that can be part of it. New Zealand degrees recognized pretty well. And, um, Mm. Certainly, we I worked in, in Europe a bit, and, and uh, it, through all that place, it was, it was recognised that it was good. And so the laws of physics are pretty the same; it's just the cultures that are different. And so, same from the hydrography perspective, the um the ocean goes everywhere, so we can generally move around the place. Um, sometimes um, from our angle. Uh, things like visas and stuff were different. So you had to, if you had multiple passports and things, that can be quite handy. And um, if you can speak another language, that's really handy. A few times I was the only person on a boat that could only speak English and everyone else has all their multitudes of languages. So um, that can help you if you're going traveling there. Um, but so, same thing for us, we're pretty international. And I guess the other good example is that, and I think we've all had a bit of experience, is that you've got the management side of a construction site, but you can also design a little bit here and you can work in all the different sides of it. So I think it's a good, good field to be in. Um, Jack has a question. What subjects at school helped you help us in our day to day work? Um, any, any thoughts there? Oh, no, I can make a start on that. From Emily yeah. specifically. Yes. Yeah, sure, Steve, go. I'd rather hear from Emily, but I'll have a go because I have the microphone. Some of the weren't actually subjects at school. Some of the things that were most informing um, were sports activities where you had to work in a team and you, you added to your daily life by not just studying and not just being at home but working with a team and training for an objective and competing at as high a level as you could. Um, it was kind of strengthening of your character um, that benefited. And uh, school, of course, had a fair amount of technical stuff. Um, we all have great stories of blowing up the physics lab, and that was probably the best fun I ever had at school. Um, that's my answer, but I'm sure Emily's is more appropriate. <laughs> I was going to start with the, what, what you probably expect, um, the maths, we, we're, we're surveyors, we do triangles, we do measuring maths, you guys engineers, maths, um, but um, beyond that I think some people are quite surprised sometimes um, if you look a bit broader, um, your English skills in terms of your writing, your, your reporting, all of that stuff really matters, it doesn't matter how well you've done the job in the field, if you can't present that to your client in a way that looks professional then you're then you're not winning so that's another one um, for me but then a little bit on Steve's note there other things while I was at school I think have helped me like my sailing and um, my involvement in clearly what I'm interested in the, the ocean and, and being at sea so being able to tie knots and to drive boats and to 
use a VHF radio and stuff like that it's actually helped as well so um, two two angles there the other one was um, yeah physics math a bit of geography maybe as well um, but don't don't forget that English I think sometimes people do yeah I think that you've got to say that there's obviously there's subjects you have to do for, for requirements and those are um, you know there's sciences you have to do and you just have to ask the, whoever the career advisor whoever it is about those and those are important um, and but that and that's probably different for subjects that we're talking about now it's ones that we feel in our ongoing career that have helped us and, and that's where I think the extracurricular things that you guys are talking about make a huge difference and the interests I think I just I really I really believe find what you're interested in and pursue it because it just will lead you anywhere you want to go and you'll enjoy being there and, and you don't have to work because you're doing something you like. Mm. Yeah, and you'd be surprised what you end up using. I mean, even a little bit of drama doesn't help when you're presenting to a client and you need to get out there and be confident about what you're speaking about. Um, or being on site and creating a rapport with the contractor or with your engineer, those kind of things. They all they all filter in there. So yeah, it's 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 all part of it. Um Lily Ping has a question for Steve. Um, okay, I've read that. Oh, that cool. Do you want to go one? then? Does, I'll, I'll summarise the question to you. Read? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, thank you for that question, Lily. Um, so Lily is asking really how soon is too soon to specialize, specialize as I'm promoting, staying fairly general for a while. So, uh, um, and I would say that your career isn't static, so you're always looking to, to change a part of it or even all of it. So you don't need to do the same time. Uh, Craig's experience was fantastic. It, not really jumping around, but doing things that were slightly peripheral to the core degree and then getting back into the, the basics. Um, those sorts of things build a, a general knowledge that which, which makes you invaluable as an expert advisor. Um, so if you haven't developed some kind of general general skills, then it's probably too early to specialize. Um, so I've just started specializing that's last that's four years. So the last four years as a natural hazard specialist. So that was pro and I started I left school when I was 16. So that is um, well, it's 40 years until I started specializing. So that's about right for me, Lily. But I mean, I know you're very clever. Um, so I'll probably get there a bit sooner. But um, all the best with that. Uh, thanks, Steve. Good question. Once around the table, everyone, what's your fa or what's the project that you've been most proud of? Do you want to start, Steve? Uh, sure. Yes. Um, the project, well, the mess I've been the most proud of, I guess. I've, I've made lots of projects in the Middle East, and people get tired of me talking about those. But in the hydraulics lab uh, in the Middle East, I, I spent a couple of years teaching at a university. We flooded the un, the university fluids lab floor uh, to about 100 millimeters thickness. Um, so that's pretty much fun. But the thing I'm most proudest is when I went to the um, the maintenance engineer to say, I'm sorry, I made a mess. You have to clean up after me. Uh, I saw his face go red from the chin to the top. And uh, I'm most proud of that in all of my career. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, what about yourself? I was just thinking that then, do you know what I think it might be, is actually um, lecturing and teaching the students here at the university. Um, we always play this video, the day in the life of a hydrographer on the first day, and it's just a nice video with good music playing. Um, but they're actually doing a lot of stuff and using a lot of gear and doing a lot of techniques that we then learn about. And then we watch it again, only 13 weeks later, and I get to stand there going, look, now you know what all of this stuff is. You know how to do it, and you know how to do it well, and you know how to check things and calibrate things. And I get a bit too, bit too excited probably about that. So I think it's that kind of stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Craig? <laughs> I haven't got one, one job um, that I think that was the best thing I ever did. I, I do probably get the most value out of beaches. When we make a beach and you go down and you see a whole lot of people playing on a beach, it's, it's, it's just a real buzz. Um, I have made a mistake. <laughs> 
of going to a beach and there was a, it's only a, a very little little beach and um, there was a, a mum down there playing with her, her child on it. I thought, wow, that's tremendous. And I thought, I, I need to get a photo of this. So I need, need to get photos of this stuff. So I said to the mum, you know, can I take a photo of your child? And she looked at me at this middle-aged man wanting photos of a child. And luckily I had my wife with me and she explained that I wasn't just some weirdo, but I, I was very big on beaches. So. Um, but certainly beaches is what I get a kick out of. Right. Yeah, I must say for myself, the desalination project was really great. It was a time where the whole town or the whole city of Cape Town was rallied around this problem that we had that we were running out of water. And I was able to be part of one little bit of providing water to the city um, and solving that problem and actually being able to do something at a time when a lot of people felt very helpless about it. So I thought that was quite cool. Um, uh, Michael Allison has asked on the topic um, of subjects to study is completing a BA in civil in uh, in civil and a BSc in biology. Um, he'd like to think that these disciplines can be com combined in the coastal space. Is that wishful thinking? Um, I think Steve may have a good example with his um, uh, concrete eating worms. Uh, yes, I mean that's, I mean that's a fantastic, fantastic combination that you've got there um actually quite envious so i think that is is great particularly in the coastal zone um where we, we've got uh sea it's land we've got rising sea level, um, and we've got the the basically the physical forces of erosion and um wave action and so everything meets in that zone i think they really well together and particularly if you're looking for I mean, sea worms eating concrete, uh, it's not unique to Salala and it's not a unique situation overall. So there was plenty of opportunities to put that to work. And because you've got more than one, you already have a broader field, brilliant generalize, producing a generalization. Um, that's great. That will be a great foundation for building a career on. I think it's very good. Well done. Yeah, and um, from the uh, offshore pipelines, the marine growth in that is something that becomes a big problem. And even marine growth on right. piles for jetties and wharves, it adds extra loads onto it. So um, it, it, it's a, a good combination that you've got there. And there's, um, there's potential. Craig, what about starting? Sorry, I was going to say there's potential. Oh, sorry, Craig. Have that thing too, yeah. The biology and the civils, I think it's a a great couple of perspectives because I think it's really easy for engineers to get hung up on the um, very hung up on the physics and the and the hard hard uh, engineering and uh, and it's a real mm. advantage I think to have that perspective of looking at it from the ecological biological uh, perspective as well. So I you don't know anything yet, but at least you know a little bit a little bit about a couple of things. It's good. Sorry, Emily. Oh, sorry, I was just, just going to say again that, that habitat mapping that people are very interested in now and understanding why certain creatures visit certain places and, and you know, we have lots of information on why Mau Maui dolphins go to specific bays, but then we have no idea what's in that bay and so there's combinations of that sort of thing there too. Plus I attended an excellent presentation at the Coastal Society Conference in Invercargill about, um, I'm going to get the wording wrong here, but basically natural um, uh, breakwaters. So so stone but with mm. with critters i'm going way out of my zone here now <laughs> growing on them so you understanding all of that living would be fantastic. brilliant um and it's 6 p.m but i think we've got time for one more question if you don't mind sticking around craig uh starting your own company what was it like with the work-life balance of that Or had to compromise on, on home life and I think um, it has given me great work-life balance now um, on a, if, a, if a Friday is very sunny and flat you'll find that I have to do a lot of site visits out in Hodeg and Gulf um, and that's part of, 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 of the good work-life balance my wife also 
loves to come on those sites and lifts and catches bigger fish than I do. So, um, you know, there's, there is a uh, payoff on the work-life balance. There are times that, um, that you do have to put time in. Um, but I think that's own company or working with other people, for other people, I think, as I say, if you go hard and really enjoy, get into what you're doing, then it, it, it opens up the opportunities for whoever you work for. Cool. Thank you very much. I think we'll end it there. Thank you to all of those that uh, attended and thank you, Emily, Craig, Steve, for presenting. Um, and behalf of the New Zealand Coastal Society. It's I think it's really cool that we can give this. And yeah, anyone who's still here, reach out to any of us. Um, I know my email is on the New Zealand Coastal Society website. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you can reach out to anyone else. We are the days of LinkedIn. It's a, a good way to get everyone. So thank mm, you. Yeah. I'll say good night. And yeah, thank you for... Thank you, Ryan. Cheerio. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, guys. Bye from sunny Dunedin. <laughs>